Okay. At this time, we'll call this meet to order, special meeting. Okay. I've been called emergency meeting to discuss the coron coronavirus. And at this time, um, I guess we'll hear from our health department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sort of a continuation of my comments from Tuesday night. As we speak, uh, Governor Cooper has called a news conference at 2 o'clock, and he'll be uh, issuing an executive order that goes into effect at 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, closing all restaurants in the state except for takeout service. There'll be no, uh, no dine-in uh, in the restaurants. And also uh, expanding unemployment uh, for those workers that are affected uh, by that executive order. And we had a conference call at one o'clock this afternoon. And uh, as you know, this situation is changing hourly <laughs> but as of 1 p.m we were told by health and human services from raleigh that we have 40 are we getting feedback no we have that we have uh 40 cases of coronavirus in north carolina in 16 different counties fortunately we have none here in anson county Health department is maintaining operations as normal. However, we are extremely concerned, uh, just as every employer is, about protecting the people that work at the health department. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've done is we have put a big sign up in front of the health department, stop, return to your car if you've traveled outside of the United States or have been to an area impacted by the coronavirus in the last 14 days, you've been in contact with someone confirmed to have had the coronavirus within the 15 days, if you have a fever, temperature of 100.4, if you're experiencing a cough or shortness of breath, trouble breathing, go back to your car, call us, press number one, and we'll send a nurse out to assess you. Um, Fortunately, all the staff at the health department is healthy. Um, a lot of the questions we're getting relate to testing for the coronavirus, and then how do you manage someone who has been tested? And so I'd like you to hear directly from the experts in that area. Uh, most of you know Dana Thomas, the nursing supervisor public health nursing supervisor for Anson County. Uh, to her right is Christy Davis. Christy is Anson County's communicable disease nurse. And uh, I'd like both of them to uh, address those issues of, of testing and then how do we manage someone that, that is in the process of being tested. They call it a PUI, person under investigation. So. Danny, you want to come up? No. I want you. I got one here and aid in the repair shop and they just quit on me, so y'all speak up so I can hear you. Sure thing. So in regards to testing, we have a lot of questions about that. Um, guidance has just changed this morning, as soon as we got in. Um, the state lab does do testing, but they have certain requirements you have to go by to send off a test for a person. They have to meet, they have to have a negative flu test, and they also have to exhibit signs that the clinician feels um, meets a lower respiratory infection. So those requirements have to be met before you send to the state lab. Now, private labs have gotten caught on and um, are now able to test for COVID-19. So you can actually go to private providers um, they can go through LabCorp and different other labs um, and the clinicians can actually use their judgment 
and send off through them, they do not have to meet the certain requirements as you would if you were with the state lab. So far at this point, with people we're trying to urge, if their symptoms are mild, we tell them to take care of themselves at home, try to isolate. Um, if they feel like they need to be seen, private providers and urgent care clinics can perform this test, but only go to the emergency room if it's a life-threatening condition. We don't want people, a lot of people showing up at the emergency room, filling it up and getting other people sick. So that at this time is where we're at. Private providers, urgent cares and hospitals can test. Multiple labs can perform the test. It depends on which lab you use as to what criteria you need to meet the test. Now, once testing is done, we are notified um, before the results even come in. We, there's a form, um, it's called a PUI form. So if a person is tested at a physician's office, they fill out the form, send it to us. We follow up with the patient um, and then they'll let us know the results come in. To date, Knock on wood, we have not had a positive case, but we are following some people that um, have been tested. Results are not in yet. So, um, Christy will go over a little bit more about how our monitoring is and tracing is, but that's about all I have at this point is for testing. Anybody cannot just show up anywhere and get tested. You have to be sick and you have to meet certain criteria and your clinician feels that you need it. Any question for her? Ms. Thomas, this may be uh, an unfair question, but I'll ask it anyway, and please refuse to answer it if you so desire. <laughs> How many people in Anson County have been tested so far? Well, so we only have been contacted over the weekend about two so far, but now that's not saying some haven't been done today. All right, thank you. That may change at any minute. Yes, ma'am, I know. Thank you. Any more questions? Do we, are they releasing the counties that the cases are involved in 16 counties? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll go ahead and, in the packets Yvonne handed out, I think everybody has one. I just didn't see it in there, I apologize. Yeah, look at the very back side. You'll see I the think case. a few minutes ago on Channel 9, they said that there was four more cases in Mecklenburg County have been confirmed. Yeah, that's what we heard earlier. Okay. Um, so this is a report, y'all can look through this, it kind of breaks down the timeline of everything that's happened so far, um, but it does give it, we get these on a daily basis, um, and it tells us exactly how many cases are. This does not break it down by county, Scott, but the website, this is from the DHHS website, you can go on there and actually look per county Thank you. how many cases are there. Thank you. I don't believe I have that map. Yeah, I have it. This is the very back. I have it. Yeah. What, one last thing, mm -hmm. uh, I apologize. What's the social distance by which someone is contagious? Or They're saying stay six feet, six foot apart. Okay. Yeah. Any question from the sheriff, Ms. Jackson, I need a one. Christy's gonna kind of let you, um, go over what we have to do as far as track monitoring and tracing once um, people are under investigation and if we do get an actual positive case for the county. I'm not going to be quite as brief. Okay, so part of what we're doing as far as reaching out with our community and our medical providers is every time we get an update received from the state, we are sending out the updates to every doctor's office, the hospital, every long-term care facility, and the assisted living facility here in Anson County so that everyone is on the same playing field, okay? Once we're notified of a positive case, as Dana mentioned, we have the person under investigation form, the PUI form. It looks like this without the sticky note. I love sticky notes. It is two pages and it tells me pretty much everything that I need to know to get a snapshot of what's going on with this patient. Keep in mind that these are people that are just tested and not people that are positive. The steps that go through with your testing is you will initially have a presumptive positive. That is when you are positive on your initial test with your provider. There is a second test off of your initial sample that is done through the state lab 
or the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. That is when you get your confirmed positive. We have lots of flow charts that tell us what to do because nurses love flow charts. <laughs> And then we can tell us just like every scenario that could possibly be in the book, there's a bubble for it, okay? We also have kind of what I call a cookbook recipe for steps for us to follow when we get the news that someone has been tested or we have a positive. Now, when people are um, tested and they do in fact show up actual positive, the provider will notify that of our test if it's done at an a commercial lab such as LabCorp request. If it is done through like the state and even LabCorp request report too, we use what's called the North Carolina Electronic Disease Surveillance System. And in that surveillance system, we get an update about each of the 100 diseases that are reportable in North Carolina. Coronavirus will be one of them. So when the hospital tests someone or the doctor's office or urgent care, wherever they deem to go, they will receive a form from that medical provider. It is guidance for the person under investigation. And basically in this paper, it says, you have been tested and suspected within reasonable doubt to have coronavirus. You are not to leave your home, you are isolated. Now at this time, the family members are not required to isolate along with them because they are not presumptive nor confirmed positive. It is highly recommended, it is not required. So what we do from that point is we will contact the individuals. This is the initial form that we have that we ask them that we enter into a system that they have named REDCAP and I cannot tell y'all what that stands for. It's long. <laughs> we also will provide the patient with a tracking list. This tracking list is for them. They will monitor their system's symptoms twice a day, temperature of the symptoms, and if they've taken any fever reducing medication or pain medications as they may act in the same manner. They'll write this down twice a day. We will make contact with them. In the bigger counties, they actually set up like a call time for them. I'm just kind of like, I know what I've got going on right now. I'm gonna call you when I have time. And I always tell people, you know, our phone number doesn't show up as a... Do you have a problem with any commissioner to have questions stop you and ask you no, why I they do. got it on the mind? Okay. I do not. What is the red cap you can't tell us about? The red cap is... Okay, so at the health department with our usual reportable diseases, we use the North Carolina Electronic Disease Surveillance System. They have not had time to update that system to where we could actually input the coronavirus to it. This is kind of like a link through like a survey monkey that the state ep epidemiologists are using to keep all their information in track and see if they can notice disease trends and areas. But we and have to know that I'm an undertaker and bodies are red tagged and we know what's going on. So I'm just wondering why you say you couldn't tell us what this red tag No, I don't, understand. I don't remember what the actual acronym red cap stood for. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the symptom monitoring log that, like I said, they'll have twice a day to write down on. It can go, to, we actually, if you are through with your disease process within 14 days, that's all we're required to do. If you're still symptomatic at day 14, we can go up to day 28. So if someone tests positive in the home, they're isolated, the other family members can go as they wish, right? Okay. But suppose... So once we know that they're positive, we're going to kind of isolate them as well. The whole family, okay. Yes. Yes, sir. We're just, you have to, it gets kind of squirrely when you start to isolate people. You want to know that that's actually, in fact, what you're dealing with. So then we have this guidance for when the health department goes out when they're under monitoring. And it's a little stricter than the guidance from the hospital or the doctor's office. And um, that's just, we're going out to make contact with them. You know, every 24 hours, we're guaranteed to make contact with you. And that includes Saturdays and Sundays as well. So like there will be people like if they test positive that we will be going in on weekends to address. Down here, it has the information for the local health director, the communicable disease nurse and who to contact should you need someone during business and after business hours. Now, if you isolate those people, how do neighbors go know 
and what and the public gonna know so, not not to visit these folks because this year you can catch this disease uh airborne or you can catch a direct contact okay so there actually is going to be a law that can be down or let me let me get to you okay all right all right so for the quarantine orders i wanted to show out that um this is what we'll be dealing with if we have someone that violates a quarantine order they and i always tell people this this isn't new for us for persons with hiv hepatitis and tuberculosis we use these quarantine orders already this is not new for us at the health department dr thompson and i've done quite a few in my 10 years with communicable disease nurse so when we have persons that actually violate the quarantine measure that are positive for the virus that's when I will work with Dr. Thompson. I'm sure Dr. Thompson will reach out to Mr. Forbes and ultimately we'll work with the county manager and Landrick to develop a plan as to what we're gonna do with this individual. Because at that point, it becomes a danger to public health when you're out spreading infectious diseases. Ms. Davis. Yes. When you go out to make these home visits or any nurse, what protective gear do you we, carry with you? We are actually fit tested for N95 masks. Anything else? We do have goggles, do we feel the need, if we feel the need for them. What about hand sanitizer? Yes, sir, we do have that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, as a self-proclaimed germaphobe, it's gonna be with me. <laughs> um, we also, and I promise you, I'm getting viewers. Um, as we, we have our guidance for what we deem low, medium, and high risk, and I also like to remind people that a risk is deemed um, six foot for 10 minutes without PPE, okay? That is six foot for 10 minutes without PPE, okay? What is the law if these people uh, didn't take your uh, opinion? If they don't take our opinion and they're positive and they have actually signed our control measure, our quarantine order, stating that they are aware that they are infectious and they are not allowed to leave their home and go out into the community, that's at the point where I will work with Dr. Thompson, who is our local health director. Dr. Thompson will work with Mr. Forbes, who is our county attorney, to make sure that we have all of our legalities in place. And then, of course, also Mr. Monroe will be involved in the process before anything is done. We've been working with Landrick and Freddie to make sure that we have a plan in place for the jail to be safe as well, should this become an issue. I mean, you wouldn't want to take them to Landrick Jail, would you? Yes, sir. I mean, why? They, 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 they actually, know. they actually have a quarantine cell available, yeah. which is an isolate, or they have a cell that is isolated that is available should we need it for quarantine. Can't bring them down there. That's what they want to stay home. Now. <laughs> stay. And, and this is uh, this is a worst case scenario. Like I said, we have these control measures that we put in place routinely with our other diseases. I think in my seven years at the health department, we only had one person that was kind of eh, okay. So we, we work really hard with these individuals. It's not like we're gonna put you in jail the first time you've got okay. issue. Okay, this person do violate it, the order, and it, you take them over to Lambert Jail, Lambert, how he gonna protect himself from his staff? I've been working with the Landrick with as far as how to keep his staff safe. Okay. And Yvonne provided them with surgical masks this morning. So they are prepared. This right here is the health department monitoring log for 28 days for the individual. So as you can see, it's a lot more lengthy than what they're doing at home by themselves. This is where you were getting to Mr. Smith. Persons that are on the isolation that are not required to so much stay at home or should you have a visitor come in your home, everybody will get this log. We encourage people to tell them, hey, I'm sick, please come back another time. Um, as we know, we live in the South. Everybody likes to bake you a cake when you feel bad and come over. We just tell them to please, thank you so much, leave it on the porch, I'll get back with you when I'm well. Yes, sir. Does it spread through the cooking process? It does not. It should be filled out, but it is in airborne droplets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can live on the surface. We're unsure now as That's to how long it can live on the surface. So, um, now when you say airborne, do you mean, does it have to have a fluid transfer or any type or can it just on the air, like well, your droplets would be that's what I'm spit through. Yeah. So this right here is for if someone comes to your house, you fill out their information so that we can contact them should a problem arise. This is if someone decides to break protocol, go to Walmart, movie theater, grocery store, whatever they do, 
we have a list of where they were so that way we could pinpoint back to if there is a problem hey you may have been exposed at your local such and such okay this is that now is ems aware if they go to a house and a person is deceased that uh uh if they don't have a signed death certificate they need to take those folks to the mall i will have to let rodney speak on that yeah i think we addressed it before <laughs> Roger. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we don't have a doctor to sign a death certificate, but there's a morgue. So if a person that has the virus and they die, what is the, what is the procedure then? How do you handle it? Once they dead, is the virus still there? Ultimately, you would treat this no differently than you would other viruses such as the flu. It would be kind of more of a standard contact precaution because the only danger of having the aerosolization going on is during the actual embalming process, to which they should be wearing their protective equipment anyways. Yes, sir. So you know, uh, you got you, you got a situation where that you're not going to expose me or any other undertaker with that type of uh, situation because. Uh, they're saying them people should be directly cremated. We're looking for the state to give us something at four o'clock. Okay. You can't subject us to all of that too, and you try to get away from it. Right, I understand your concern, and if should that happen, we will be happy to work with you right. on a case-by-case -case basis. Mr. Hoyt. Is the danger of this virus, is it just the, how contagious it is? Is the fact that we don't have a vaccine for it, or is it the actual effect on the person's body being more severe than other viruses. Rather, rather, right. rather than give opinions, uh, I'm going to get you with the facts that I do know, okay? Fair enough. All right, so a lot of what's going on with this virus is it's new. It came fast. It came in a hurry, and a lot of people were unprepared. It's <coughs> contagious as is any other virus. That's what the president said. They do not time. know where the origin of this virus started. Is that right? They suspect it to have started in Wuhan, China. In China? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. It didn't come from the Middle East? No, sir. It, the first case was... I thought you said it coming through China and you were trying to get to the United States. Well, due to the vast availability of international travel, that's how you get the rapid spread. When, and you have to think about it. When I tell you that the, um, the risk for being the risk for catching the virus is six foot for 10 minutes. And you have to think about your proximity to someone sitting in an airplane. And then those individuals go out into society and you have your individuals with compromised immune systems. You also have your individuals that are elderly and they're more susceptible to the complications of this virus. Those persons will eventually go in for treatment that exposes the healthcare providers. It, it's just the whole gamut of people just from one person. Ms. Davis, I get a little nervous when you say elderly, when you use that term. <laughs> what is your definition of elderly? So, elderly. <laughs> per guidelines in the medical field, 65 and older is going to be considered elderly. All right, so I've got a year to go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was the youngest here, and I'm... <laughs> So this is how we trace people. This is our guidance, and this is actually what we call our line list. And on this line list, this is for our use and the state use. It has everybody with their name, their address, so that way we can start to pinpoint locations and trends. So when you've gone through this disease and you, you finally, what I call, graduate and move on to better health, this is your discharge form that we present you with. You, there are two different standards for stating that someone is past their infectious period. That standard is, let's see here, I wanna quote it because they just changed it this morning. That's how fast this is evolving. Hmm. So the initial thing was you could go back into public after having two negative coronavirus tests that were 24 hours apart. Now they have actually changed it to when you are past seven days of symptom onset 
and you have been at least 72 hours without symptoms and an unmedicated fever, you are free to resume um, life as usual. Do they know how long this virus lasts in a person? It, it's going to vary by your immune system. Persons that have other comorbidities, such as like uh, diabetes or anything that's people that take like the Remicade treatments or anyone that's HIV positive, anybody that has an immunocompromising condition or takes a medication that lessens their immune system, they're obviously going to be the ones that are greater impacted by this virus, as opposed to someone that runs three miles a day with no health problems that eats kale. But anybody go to pulmonary is susceptible to this. Sir? Anybody go to pulmonary? Anyone that has um, lung conditions obviously is more subjectable to having more complications from the virus. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will not survive the virus. It just means that they're probably going to have a harder time. Are they using symptomatic treatment? to cure this or to, to so, this? As of right now, the only treatment that is recommended is supportive treatment, which means you treat the symptoms okay. of the actual virus itself. Um, there are other guidances that come along with like what you would not use with the medication or that you would not use with the virus for treatment. But as of right now, there is no stapled down treatment. Should we quell the fever or let the fever run its course? I'm sorry to hit you with that. No, that's okay. Um, Medical providers have different opinions on fevers. Sure. Obviously, the fever is a, your body's immune response as to how you're handling something. You don't want to let your fever get above a certain point. That's where it gets kind of gray with people as far as fevers go. I'm not a medical provider, so I don't want to elaborate on that. But at a certain point, you do have to start worrying about brain damage and organ damage. Right. Any questions? If this person is isolated in their home, at what point are they carried to a hospital facility? Okay, if we could, if the symptoms can be man managed at home, we don't want to take them anywhere to risk exposing anyone else. We're hoping that this will be something that we could get through with supportive treatment. However, should somebody start to develop like respiratory distress, cardiac issues from this, they will obviously and immediately be transported to the emergency. The quarantine order that we hand them actually gives them orders that says, this is the number you can call should you need emergency help. You tell them that you have or are suspected of having the coronavirus so that that way EMS can be notified ahead of time before they get into the home to make sure EMS is protected. You have a doctor at the health department or PA, what, what, what do you have? We have a nurse practitioner. Um, right now, how are your people going to handle this? Are you got the equipment to handle it? We're low on supplies, but we're also filtering calls. Low on what sort of supplies, Rodney? Mask, gowns. Hand sanitizer? Mm -hmm. We've got gloves, but um, gowns and N95 masks were low on. And the surgical mask that we have to put on the patient. What type of mask is that? Surgical mask. A regular surgical mask for the patient. Okay. We're wearing N95. M95? M95. M95. I've, I've got some 1895. What is that? It's the type of filter that they have in the mask. Paint filter. <laughs> That's what it is. Paint filter. <coughs> but the regular surgical mask does not stop the inflow of it, right? It just stops the transmission of it. That's why they can stop it. Well, it, it does contain all the droplets and stuff like that. When do you expect to get some more supplies? Or you don't know when you can get it. You don't know. The state, the, 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 the state not happening up with any of that. I put in a request today for DSS, and they done told us that unless you're a health care provider from a few, from like hospitals, EMS, health departments, you're probably not going to get supplies. So, what is Lula supposed to do? I mean, Lula have, how many staff members do you have? I currently have 51. 51. Okay, how are we limiting the clients from coming in? Are they just still coming in as usual, or you got, got some time? Well, right now at the Department of Social Services this morning, we started the, um, doing as much as we possibly could with customers at the front desk. 
uh, through the windows, signing applications, gathering as much information as possible. Uh, if you have to do interviews, you're currently doing them in the conference room uh, so that there's at least space for six feet between the worker and the customer. Is that, uh, you checking their health conditions at the social service? We're not checking health conditions. We are not checking I'm health service. conditions, but if they, on our observation, they appear to have uh, fever or are doing excessive coughing, then uh, we are limiting our services to them. We're not, not providing services, uh, but we are asking them to come back or give us a call over the phone. Mm -hmm. Do you have uh, anybody in the health field working for you? I do not have anyone in the health field, but I do have social workers that are required to go make home visits, especially mm -hmm. if there's a child protective services or adult protective services referral. Even if they go to the home and the family reports that there's someone in the house that's ill, then we still are required uh, to go in and assess for the safety of the disabled adult or the child. Mm -hmm. Are you required to take somebody from the health department? Not uh, that's, the, that's the law over there. We are not required to take someone with us, nor are we required to uh, make a report. But if we come in contact with someone, we would um, touch base with the health department just to see if they are aware. You know, I appreciate the up, updates that we've been receiving from the president also from Governor Cooper, and those have been very, very helpful. But here in Anson County and perhaps in other counties in North Carolina, we have some basic safety needs. Masks, hand sanitizer, um, sanitizing wipes, and maybe there's some others to add to that list. I really think it would be in the best interest of the citizens of Anson County as well as our staff if this board were to write a letter to the governor on behalf of the citizens of Anson County and the Board of Commissioners and staff and make a special request for these basic needs. I think that's a good idea. Um, with preparing some stuff now, I do have some masks. Um, I did not realize that Lula needed some. Uh, we have, since they say now, surgical masks, so I can meet her needs for one for person right now until we can get more. Um, we do have some hand sanitizers. I have gave some to yeah, the SS and to Landry. Um, Rodney, I've told him if he needs any for EMS time. I don't have an abundance of supplies, but I do have enough to meet the needs of right now for those. There's also guidance out there now for us to reuse our masks and ones that are expired, we can use until the supply chain is restocked. And the guidance on our part actually changed today to where we are approved to use a surgical mask when working with individuals unless we are doing a nebulizer treatment which is where it then becomes aerosolized and then at that point they recommend that it be done in a negative pressure room which our hospital does have or in a private isolation room with the door closed any other questions Thank you. Yes, no, it's not a, it's not a question. Okay. Mr. Smith asked a little while ago what red cap was, and basically what that is is research electronic data capture. And usually, what organizations do, they they just drop the last part of capture off, and they do the acronym red cap. And it's a web-based program for doing clinical research. Thank you, Mr. Woodburn. Thank you. The hospital's not here, but um, they were there at the meeting at 10 o'clock this morning. And uh, just so you know, they have been uh, a lot of planning uh, for their response. Uh, as of this morning, if you go to our local hospital, uh, you will be uh, screened or triaged before you're allowed in the building. They'll check your temperature. Uh, before you're uh, allowed in. They also have implemented that procedure for their staff. Staff uh, will be checked uh, before they're allowed in the building. 
couple of other things that are going on around the county. Uh, if you haven't heard, uh, there's no visitation at the jail. Uh, the long-term care facilities are essentially, uh, Christie's been out, met with them. They're essentially on lockdown, no visitors at all, not even immediate family. Uh, Governor Cooper, as you know, issued the executive order on Saturday afternoon, closing K through 12. I have had some questions about the daycare centers. Uh, Health and Human Services specifically uh, did not order the closure of the daycare centers and we're hopeful that they will be able to remain open. Closing all the daycare centers just uh, exacerbates the problem with childcare for people that have to work like nurses. Having said that, uh, your daycare centers are private businesses and each individual daycare center will make a decision as whether or not they're gonna remain open or not. Uh, the American Dental Association has recommended that dentists uh, stop doing all elective dental procedures and only do emergency procedures. Uh, I got a call a few hours ago from Matthews Periodontics. Uh, they are shutting down until further notice and probably we'll see, given the nature of dental work, I, I suspect we'll see other dentists uh, doing that also. Uh, that's about where we're at. Uh, I think Dane and Chrissy did a, did a good job of summarizing things. Uh, Christy is the expert and I would encourage you to tell your constituents if they have questions to call the health department and uh, we have the experts there that will be able to answer their questions. We also <coughs> have received guidance on virtually every subset of the population that you can think of. Uh, educationals, daycares, prisoners, homeless, etc. And uh, we have access to information on how to manage those populations in, in this situation. Finally, I would just say uh, as you all know, this is not like a snowstorm. Uh, we're gonna be dealing with this probably at least through the end of May is my guess. Uh, and I think it's a, a series of steps and you've seen that already. Uh, close the schools, social distancing, wash your hands. Uh, now, as of 6 p.m. today, closing, uh, all dine-in service at the restaurants. Mecklenburg's declared a state of emergency. They're closing all the uh, restaurants, bars, nightclubs. And, uh, but I, I'm, I'm pleased that at this point, we don't have any <coughs> coronavirus that we're aware yeah. of here in Anson County. Dr. Thompson, you have told us what the hospital was doing. What can Lula do at her agency? when people come in. They're checking people before they enter the hospital. What can she do? Uh, Ludo could talk with Chrissy would be my recommendation. Uh, Sheriff Reed has talked with Chrissy extensively and uh, I would recommend that Lula and, and uh, Chrissy talk. Uh, at a minimum, you know, you would have the signage like we have at the health department. If you have this, uh, stop, call us. We'll send you over to the health department, so something like that. And I have actually worked with a daycare in the facility and a couple of other private businesses have reached out to me and I've helped them develop plans that they can use in place of this virus. Um, Lula, I'm happy to work with you if you need to work out a system as far as getting people in and out of your facility and as the health department, we're doing the resources. You have a system that you can test folks if they come in. We at the health department do have tests, but we are not testing. What are you are not testing? We are not testing because to use the state lab, which is who our tests are from, you have to be able to do a negative rapid flu test in your building, which we cannot do because we cannot get the test. 
But where do they go to be tested? At the hospital? They can go to their local physician. They can go to any urgent care or they can go to the emergency room. I also advise persons that Union County and Indian Trail has a 24 hour urgent care to alleviate strain from the emergency room. So we don't have nothing in Anderson County? Our local physicians can test for this virus through Black Corps. And we only have one doctor, Dr. Lincoln. We have Carolina Primary Care, care at the hospital and AmeriCare. I'm waiting to hear back from AmeriCare and ARMS as far as their capability of testing. I haven't heard back from Dr. Um, Elliott's office either. Can Dr. Lincoln test? Dr. Lincoln is on vacation right now. But I can promise you he probably will. <laughs> He sends me special well, texts on people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> no. If so there is a problem, we want to send the people tested. where they can be tested. Sir? We want to send them where they can be tested. Yes, we, we're working on identifying the providers that are, in fact, testing. I do know for sure that Dr. Lincoln's office does use LabCorp, so as long as he can get the actual kits needed to test, then his office does have the capability to test. The once, hospital utilizes LabCorp. That's who they use for their testing as well. Once you have this list, will you put it on uh, some kind of voicemail at your office where so people can go? The way that my voicemail is set up at the health department now, because I have had a little influx of persons calling, I'll say that you've reached Tracy Davis with Medical Disease and Tuberculosis in our city county. Um, if you are calling for general questions on the coronavirus, I have the coronavirus hotline number listed. I also have information for the NCDHHS website to where individuals can go on there and find the information that they need as well as the county breakdown map for the state on there as well. And then I always instruct people that if you're calling in addition to this information, please leave your name and number and I'll get back with you. And then on an individual basis, I'm directing questions. This is a very serious dilemma in the world. This year, virus. Yes, sir, and we're taking and, it very uh, seriously. Christy and Dana both have been posting to the um, Anson County Facebook page, um, um, trying to get things put onto our health department webpage, but that's on my fault because I haven't had the time to do it all. But Christy and Dana have been putting on the Facebook, keeping information out to the public and all. So anything like that ought to be put on the Facebook page for them to view, okay. for the public to view. Yeah, we're working on something to put on the county's web page also. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Shelby em Emerson over at the uh, chamber told me this morning that anything, any kind of information that the county needs to disseminate to the public, she will be glad to help with that. So that that's a source to a resource too. Rashonda Perry also made that comment that she would be glad to disperse it to her people too. So. And the superintendent of the schools, yeah. Told that today. Okay, what is your recommendation for the county to do at this time? Do you have a recommendation? For recommendation for to protect our county employees. I'm to sorry, guys. to protect well, especially the people that well everyone, but what can we do? to protect our employees that work for the county of Anton? We would do, uh, you know, every employer, uh, Mr. Monroe and I was talking about people coming into the government center to pay their bills, uh, the grocery stores, uh, the employees. So we would recommend uh, for older people, like my wife, uh, some of you stay at home. And then uh, if I'm at a, uh, a teller at a bank or if I'm downstairs uh, at the, I'm gonna use hand, attend, hand sanitizer between every after, a, a, every customer. Uh, and to the extent, uh, a good example is the Anson County Partnership for Children. Uh, they are winding down. They'll be going, uh, closing the office at the end of the week. They are uh, distributing diapers, baby wipes, and other supplies, daycare centers, and the families that they work with. And they'll be re working remotely uh, starting next week. 
they, they will not be staffing the office. Uh, a lot of people can't do that. And so the precautions you would take are the same that you take for protecting yourself against the flu. Uh, and we've all seen those, uh, wash your hands, avoid touching your face, et cetera. Uh, do you have the people in the tax office uh, as uh, sanitizer and all people coming in pay their taxes and all that they can give them sanitizer? As Yvonne said, uh, I, I don't know if you, if you have hand sanitizer, if they have. We will be discussing that this afternoon. Currently, uh, we do not have hand sanitizer downstairs for them. We do not. We do not. We do not. Right now, we do not. But can Yvonne, can you get the people that's handling money downstairs to the sanitizer? Staff, I, can. I, can, I can defer for staff. We just don't, you know, we want to take care of our staff first and stuff else. So we just right. like that now, yes, we can do that. Because, I mean, these people are handling money that's come in off the street and, I mean. Yeah, and if somebody can let me know that, just like, you know, because I don't know what most departments have and don't have. So, I mean, you know, if I can help with hand sanitizer for staff, I can do that. And they're just small bottles. I don't have big cup size, but, you know, some's better than none. Yeah, so. that's correct. Mr. Forbes. Does a hand sanitizer just give the virus an opportunity to mutate and become even resistant to a hand sanitizer, making it stronger and more lethal? They recommend there are some bacteria and viruses that are not killed by hand sanitizer already. So the Because people use the hand sanitizer. The ultimate thing that we okay. encourage persons to do when available is to wash their hands when not feasibly available hand sanitizer. It's, it's essentially better than nothing. Better than nothing. Uh, Mr. Monroe, I've staffed a pound of money downstairs. I apologize. We do have sanitizer downstairs at the tax office. I apologize for watching us on TV, so uh, I misspoke. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sh shouldn't they go to the bathroom maybe every 30 minutes and wash their hands with soap and water also? Would that not help? We're getting into daily procedures, and I'm not sure I want to sit right here and tell you the best way for the people downstairs doing the tax uh, receiving function, how they should do their job right now. Uh, but that's a question that I could take up with the tax collector and tax assessor and uh, brush your deeds this afternoon. And we can have a procedure after that meeting to let you know how we're going to move forward with that. Well, they say this helps. It's on nationwide, worldwide right. TV. You say use this and then use soap and water. That's what they tell you. So these, you okay. can't expose them people not have nothing there with handling monies and what have what other offices we have need this uh sanitize in if you dealing with the public i agree and we should have been doing this beforehand to be quite honest this is basic sanitize basic hygiene yeah. so from here on out if that's the direction of the board to make sure everyone washes their hands well, if you if you have the governor and the president closing the restaurants and all, where we can't go in there, it's a serious matter. It's, it's, it is. I don't disagree with that. And I think we need to protect our employees. You're correct. Hey, you're saying the restaurants are closed for inside eating. A special needs person won't be able to go in and eat. Six o'clock. Six o'clock, right? No, Chick fil A, you only get. Five. Huh? Not after When the service. Is that every day or starting? That would be from Six now on. Six o'clock today. From now on. Today. Mm -hmm. Just when the service. Uh, well, I, I had to carry my grandson. They'll be eating and eating. Mm -hmm. I had to carry him in and get him in a place to eat. You can't feed him in the car. You, you can't pick up nothing, careful. He's going to fight you time he gets in the car for the food. I noticed I've been there three or four different times and down in the area would be closed and when they see me come up they'd come open the door and let me and him in. So. In all honesty Commissioner Sykes I, I don't know if there will be special accommodations for situations like what you just described. Mm -hmm. uh, the executive order that the governor is issuing as we speak uh, 
prohibits all dine-in visits. That's all I know. That's all we know at this point. Thank you. Mr. Monroe. Yes, sir. We over the surrounding counties, what are they doing? Can you tell us? It depends on what you what's common across many counties right now are that people are are suspending work work related travel, uh, particularly areas that may have already had an outbreak. So we've done that here at the county, is suspend work related travel outside the county. We've also, like other places, have required people to go home if they're sick, if they feel sick, look sick exhibiting any symptoms of the coronavirus to go home and use the sick leave. That's common practice across the board. Again, uh, making sure that people are going home and take self quarantining for themselves. Uh, we ask people to report that they're going to high risk areas. We can't control people what they do outside of work, but we would like to know if they are going to go to Mecklenburg County or, or Italy or Wake County or wherever it is that has a high concentration of coronas, uh, the coronavirus outbreak that we know that so we can then uh, act accordingly. And then most recently, uh, we talked to our department heads and we basically said each department, because you are so different, so diverse in your, your functions, that you develop a guidance specific to your job, to your, your department, excuse me, that reduces the opportunity for infection. So across the board, those are things that are being done across other counties as we are doing it here. Some other things taking place are statement of the declarations of state of emergencies have taken place. There's been flex time schedules put in place, rotating people's work hours that have been in place. We have not adapted any of those things or adopted any of those things just yet. We are still developing some plans for how we want to move forward. Well, well it's social service. I think we really need a plan now so we won't have so many people in that building at one time. Well, Ms. Jackson and I could discuss how we could do that. What do you have that people can uh, 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 check people's temperature? We have, I mean, we have our thermometers we use at the health department, but we don't have. You don't have the same that you. We use the mouth thermometer, which mm -hmm. tell us. We can get the stairs for Dana to order for the crews that go on the Last week, Ms. Jackson had an emergency meeting with her staff. I think it started at 4.30, ended a little bit before 5, held it right in the lobby of our DSS building because that's the largest space we have inside that building. I attended the meeting and I'm glad I did because there's some very useful, helpful information disseminated good questions and some concerns expressed. One concern is we still have employees that are living paycheck to paycheck. We have employees with limited number of sick days. We have new employees with no sick days or very few sick days. And it came to my attention or my mind that says, why don't we, under these special circumstances, which could be very grave, why don't we allocate an additional 10 paid sick leave days to every employee in Anson County government from now until June 30th. That way if a person is sick, they're not penalized. They continue to get paid for a certain period of time. They, they don't feel like they're forced to come to work so that they can maintain their economic status. I think the federal government's already implemented something like that. You can't get rid of folk. No, I don't think the federal government has instituted a special sick paid sick leave program as yet, uh, Mr. Smith. I think, correct, they have not done that just yet. They passed a House bill that would do something to what you're talking about, but right. it hasn't passed Senate and hasn't been signed in by the President. Uh, we discussed a little bit of that in small groups around the county, uh, Commissioner Gatewood, and our solution to that was we have a restriction here in donating sick leave for individuals. We have to take our vacation leave and donate it to someone to, and that trans, transitions to sick leave. Well, we thought about changing that restriction and having people donate sick leave to sick leave to help individuals out who are young in their tenure here with the county to facilitate 
to make sure they have a whole paycheck coming out. Uh, as, all, as far as a blanket, uh, 10 day paid sick leave, we had not really fully discussed that and we we're waiting on guidance from the federal government and the state before we implemented anything like that. Well, I think the guidance from the federal government may come soon or it may not. And we have a need here in Anson County where we have an opportunity to act now. Uh, I don't think it would cost the county anything. It could benefit employees as well as citizens uh, to do something like a special 10 days paid sick leave until June 30th of this year. And that would apply to every full-time employee. I don't and, think you can do anything inconsistent with the state or federal government, the county can. I think the federal government, um, <clears throat> according to about an hour ago, they are talking about sending some kind of um, check out to every, to every individual. individual. So I don't know what's that going to happen. I think we'll know later today. Well, I think that would be good, but my recommendation is not a check is paid sick leave time for employees that are sick and reluctant to stay at home because of fear of losing uh, part of their paycheck. And in this recommendation, is it based off coronavirus symptoms or just in general? Because th that's what this whole scare is about, is the coronavirus. It will be paid sick leave in general. I mean, how? I know you can't control it, but how do you control the people that get the sick leave and burn it time to get it. I mean, I'm, I'm You may not be able to control it specifically, uh, Chairman Streeter, and I guarantee you there'll be one or two employees that may abuse it. But under these special circumstances, if we want employees to stay home when they're sick, I'm suggesting we help them by granting them some extra paid sick leave days from now until end of June. School of government's got stuff out there for recommendation for this type of stuff also for essential and non-essential employees. Y'all might want to look at that. I think it requires some more discussion. Thank you, Rodney. Oh, I've been getting that school stuff from school of government and there have been recommendations totally since this began. You know, there's a conference call tomorrow for the school of government. What, 10 or 12 tomorrow? I figured they're going to show the guidance for that on the I mean, I'd love to more sick days. <laughs> we don't have anybody in Anson County that you know of with this virus. Correct. Thank you. I was going to just add a comment along the line of what uh, Commissioner Gable was saying is maybe something like that put in place on a case-by-case -case basis, on an as-needed basis. You know, somebody that's, that gets sick that, that uh, in that situation doesn't have any leave or, or very limited. You know, somebody sitting on a bunch of leave won't, won't have an issue. So that, that, that was the only thing I was going to mention. <coughs> you restricting that to this virus? No, I didn't say restricted to the virus. I said sickness. So just a thought. Oh, I think it's an excellent thought. Monroe, can you enlighten us on this a little bit, please, sir? Well, it requires a little bit more, but I would think based off what we've observed in the county, the, the fair way, because to your point, this is about a special situation, the term you use, the special situation against the coronavirus. And if we're just going to do it as a general sick leave increase, then I think that's unfair to the special situation. It would have to be tied to the coronavirus as part of it. Uh, however, before even going down that road, I think there are other alternatives, such as making sick leave available in transition from one person to the other, that makes it easy in providing that, giving that sick leave to ensure that they're covered. I think that is a fair and equitable way of doing it for this time period uh, without having to provide a whole new subset of sick leave to go along with it. So. I would I would defer that we I would suggest that we don't do that for the short term. And if the guidance comes out from the federal government that this is going to be passed by the Senate and by the signed by the president, then we will make that correction. Well, do you have a problem doing it case by case? I mean, because they're probably um, 
be some cases. You're talking about tied to the Bible? Yes, uh huh. You know, a person thinks they have they're having a fever. Well, <laughs> we don't need them in the workplace if they don't have no time. I mean, some people don't have sick time. They may come on to work sick and make everyone sick. Some people should agree with that. However, I think we have to be very judicious about this. If a person who just started with the organization two weeks ago or even two years ago, they may not have enough time. And we need to make it easy for them to receive time and transition. For individuals who have been here for 20 years, 25 years, if they have no sick time, I think that's a consideration that we need to worry about. Uh, because that's, that's either they've been sick in the past, which is legitimate, or it's abuse there. And I think that we have to be very cautious about providing more opportunities for people to abuse leave, even in this special circumstance. So uh, people should go home if they're sick, bottom line. We should, not, we should not allow people to come in to work feverish, infectious, and spreading the disease. But I think if we're going to tie it to the coronavirus, we have to be verified that they actually had it. It can't be, I feel sick, I'm going to go home, try to get the 10 days of leave or whatever we you want to decide, and it turns out to be fraudulent. Or it turns out to be, oh, I, I was just a little under the weather that day. That should not be it. They should not be free to leave at that point. What if we were sent to the health department to be checked? It requires... Can you go through that whole testing again for us? Well, if they come to us, we can't actually test because we would have to um, meet the criteria of the state lab, which would be first thing they would have to have a negative flu test, which we don't have or can't get. And then it would be up to the clinician if they had a lower respiratory infection, um, then it would have to go to the state lab. So we would have to get prior approval from the state before we even did it. But you could um, check to see if they have a fever, couldn't you? Oh yeah, we can check if they have a fever. So then we can, we can't say it was. We can't say it was. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> that's that's the piece. That's the, yeah. I think bottom line, basically, if somebody says they're sick and it's, it's questionable whether they're sick, you send them to the health department to see if they've got <coughs> symptoms and say, yeah, there's something wrong with them. Not necessarily the coronavirus, but yeah, they they're under the weather. And I think that's what we're trying to go with it. I believe. I think we just want to tap into that coronavirus. That thing kills so many people. No, I'm talking about, I think there's some concern about people misusing it. In other words, if I'm an employee and I find out I've got 10 extra days, then all of a sudden I need a day off, I'm going to say I'm sick. And may not be anything wrong with me. So that's the reason I say, you go send them to the health department, they'll check me out. If nothing wrong with me, they're going to show there's nothing wrong with me. So then the county manager can deal with it, or the manager can deal with it accordingly. The government is closing a whole lot of industries everywhere oh, in the United States. Yeah. I, I'm just holding them down. I'm just saying what could be done in the situation we're talking about. That's, that's all I'm saying. I'm I'm in favor of not doing that right now until we get more guidance coming from the federal and state levels in regards to providing 10 days of leave in a, so in in conjunction with the coronavirus. Uh, I think to help in the short term, if we were to allow people to transfer sick leave to sick leave to make that transition easier for individuals, for individuals to have a large bank and can just dole it out to people who are uh, lacking the amount of sick leave they need to take time off, I think that would be a nice first step. And if it gets worse, then we consider changing that whole policy. But right now, I don't think we need to go that extreme with our, just yet. Well, I don't think it's to that extreme, uh, Mr. Monroe. You know, if this board can take action today that could save potentially one or two or three lives, who knows how many, then I'm willing to accept a little abuse of a policy, a special policy, under the circumstances that we find ourselves in. If we're unwilling to grant 10 days for this short period of time until June 30th, in a general sense, then maybe we need to find a way to tie it to the virus. In other words, if there's a family that has a virus in the home that's been confirmed, then they are candidates for the special leave, maximum up to 10 days. If the employee, unfortunately, comes down with the virus, which could happen, then they qualify 
for the special leave. I don't think there would be abuse once we have confirmation that there's situation in the home or the employee itself, him or herself, has the virus. So I will make that, that motion at this point in time. It may not get a second, may not go any further, but I do think it's something this board needs to consider seriously. We have a motion. I believe that uh, the federal government has guidelines out there where these people are protected with this virus. And ain't a thing you can do about it. They are protected financially, protected in the home, as I understand. Mr. Smith, I understand what you're saying, but that's not my understanding as, you, as of yet. I don't think that decision been made yet either. Uh, I'll I'll second. A, okay, we'll have a motion and a second. Repeat your motion again, Mr. Gatewood. I would say uh, grant a maximum of up to 10 days of special paid sick leave if we can tie it to the virus. Either the situation in the home where a family member has come down with it and it's confirmed, or the employee, him or herself, has come down with it and it's confirmed. Mr. Yeah, Chairman, make sure you get the word if. <laughs> Problem. Mr. Manny, how do you feel about that? Oh, I don't vote. I'm just. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Right now, the clarification discussion. Oh, well, again, if the board chooses to go along with that, as long as it's confirmed, is what I'm hearing. If it's confirmed in association with the virus, be it someone in the house or the individual themselves have a confirmed case of the coronavirus, then they will be awarded or allowed to have 10 paid days of sick leave, regardless if they have zero in the bank or a thousand in the bank. Right. That's why I hear it. Uh, again, my stance is that's too far, of a, too far of a step to take right now. However, if the board chooses to go with that, that's what we'll do. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Okay. Mr. Smith, did you vote? I didn't vote for it. As a commissioner, don't we have an obligation to vote? I, I'm just asking actually, the question. Actually, he does not have to vote. Have to vote. It will be counted as an affirmative vote if he yeah. does not All right. vote. All right. Thank you very much for that clarification. It'd be like getting up, leaving, and meeting without being excused. Yes. Thank you. It's along the same lines, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I'll make another motion. That is that this board write a letter to the governor or maybe as the director of the Department of Health and Human Service, underscoring our need for basic safety supplies for our employees, hand sanitizers, sanitizing wipes, and masks. Second. We have a motion and a second. Now, who you want to do this letter? So let's tell who we want this letter. We send it to the governor and we copy uh, Ms. Cohen, who is the- Dr. Cohen. Dr. Cohen, Dr. Cohen, who is director of North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. He's the head person. Mr. Manager, can you get that letter ready to go out? We'll work on writing the letter. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, let it be known by raising your right hand. Okay. Okay, I, as the chair, I will, can I make a motion or Mr. Mr. Vice Chair, I have to turn it over to you to make a motion? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm thinking that under certain you know, special conditions, the chair can make a motion. Typically, they don't. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Well, at this time, I would like to make a motion that we suspend all meetings, commissioner meetings, until further notice. You issue an directive. I think we need that if we. Okay, Mr. 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 Forbes. With respect, you cannot suspend no. Legally, you cannot suspend them. There are methods by which you can have these meetings, but you cannot suspend them because it's statutory. The governor's order does not suspend statutes under North Carolina law. So even the, even the, the governor's order of quarantine and things of that nature, he cannot suspend your, the obligation of the county to have a monthly regularly scheduled meeting. Um, there are certain ways to handle that. I have different 
methods by which you can uh, insulate yourself from the public and things of that nature. And I'll be glad to discuss those with you um, if you'd like. But, but from a legal standpoint, to suspend those meetings would be in, in violation of the statute, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, if we have the meeting, we will have to limit to 10 people. Is that correct? One would need one would need to provide a separate listening facility. Um, I have I have certain guidelines where what we can do is we can provide a way for the public to hear the meetings and to do public comment, um, and we could, we could set that up in a different room to insulate the board or, or whichever. Well, you wouldn't want more than ten people in that room. All I'm saying is what has to be done if if it's within the will of the of the commission to land the people, people on the government. government. <laughs> you can do that, but you, you Mr. Need, Paul, you if you got ten people here that want to make comments, more than ten people, then you have more than ten people in one room. There are ways. Are you going to set it up in different rooms? There, they could have them in different rooms. We could, we could even just provide it to where they can listen to it electronically at home. We could provide. Well, we're doing that right. Call we're, doing, we're doing that right now. You, you are correct. And, and you're not suspending the meeting. We're, we're having a meeting, we're having a meeting here, providing the, uh, the public a way to partake of this and hear it. Now, for the public comment section, we could suspend that or put it off to another meeting um, in that particular, under those circumstances. Allow them to submit their comments in writing uh, so that they could make those comments in writing and be read aloud because that that part is not supposed to be Responded to anyway. It's just supposed to be heard so we can limit that up to 30 minutes for the total meeting Three minutes per person. But what happened to everyone show up? I'm the only person show up for the meeting. I can't have no meeting. And we do not have a quorum Therefore we do not have a meeting <laughs> There are so ways that around that way to handle it. We can expand on that later if you'd like <laughs> Okay, we will. Yes, sir. Right. Okay, Dr. Sims has sent a list of things that I was going over. Um, and he also put on here, we limit the number of people riding in county vehicles. Each one of y'all have his list of things in front of you. How do you all feel about that? See everything. The only thing I'd like to mention on page 35 and in the uh, information that the health department gave us, and, I, and I've uh, been told this before, it says that as far as face masks are concerned, the CDC does not recommend that people who are well wear a face mask to protect themselves from respiratory diseases, including COVID-19. So I will change that to reflect what's in this information. I think he's got on here everybody that wears gloves and face masks as far as uh, county employees are concerned. Other than that, I don't know. Hmm? No, no, you don't need that. I don't. Yeah. It says best if the person that's sick is the one that's wearing the mask, so that helps contain the, the particles and all. But somebody that's well, there's it, it, not that much of an advantage to wearing the mask. Okay. May I speak in reference to the uh, limited number of people in the county vehicle? That may be an obstacle for DSS if there's a situation where we're transporting children it will probably be a, not possible to limit the number of people in the vehicle. Wouldn't be for an extended period. Mm -hmm. Preferably wouldn't be for an extended period. Ms. Jackson, could you use the microphone please? I can barely hear you. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. In reference to the good afternoon. In reference to the limit of the number of people that can be transported in a county vehicle. I think that may cause some concerns for our um, Child Protective Services staff in the event that we are transporting children um, or have to transport a family. So that, that would be cause for concern for us. So you need at least two employees in that vehicle, correct? Most of the times we do when we're transporting children. Yes. Or if there's a situation where there's a large number of children. And the vehicle. Can you, why not carry two vehicles? You possibly could carry two vehicles, but when you say limit the number of people in county vehicles, I 
was trying to make sure it wasn't limiting it to two. Two staff per vehicle. Okay. Would that so work? That, I'm not sure. That's the regular routine. You need Normally, the regular routine, if there are, it, it depends on what we're faced with when we go out to um, a, a case or a home and the number of children that are involved. <clears throat> so I, I don't know, but if we were to say that we would limit it to two people per vehicle, two then. Cans, really. Okay. Is that what the request is when we say limit? The number of count of people per vehicle. Yeah, but I'm a clientele. But she got five or six. But she got five or six children to pick up. She's carrying two vehicles. I think at this point we're starting to get a little bit too much into the weeds of how the day-to-day operations of our departments run. And although these are thoughtful considerations, and I believe we should all abide by those or have something in our mind when we move forward. If we're going to start legislating from right here about how Ms. Jackson transports vehicles, that, that's getting too, too much into the weeds for us. And, and it was, my concern was just primarily what that number would be limited to. If we're saying limit the number, I thought that was the statement. Yeah, but that we would to, limit the number of If this virus gets worse, it may come to that, that we have to make decisions with the day-to-day -day operation. Agreed, but I think it will give us more time to think about it and not write on the fly. I mean, Ms. Jackson hasn't had a chance to digest. She hasn't seen Mr. Sim, Commissioner Sims' list of things, and I think it would be a little bit unfair to put her on the spot to make a determination yeah. right now. It's going to get worse before they get better. So I, I wouldn't mind having a discussion in regards to this. We could do it by conference call. No one has to leave their house. And yeah, we could do it over something like that. Uh, but I think they're trying to make a policy like this right now is a bit unfair to the people who do the job. Are you tough? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you put that out. <laughs> Mr. Monroe, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, I think the county manager and department head needs some time to come up with additional ideas and recommendations to protect county staff and the public. I agree. Okay, how about county meetings? Not the commissioner meeting, department having meetings out the work with the public. So far, remember that ten people. So far, everything that I've been a part of and seen over the last two weeks have been canceled and have been canceled indefinitely. So we're not even having those. Uh, the census was going to get together this week, cancel that. Land use conference of plan was going to be done this week, cancel that. Next week, the agriculture civic center was supposed to be scheduled, we canceled that. Yep. Uh, AEDC next week, I think, is next Thursday, yeah. also canceled. So we're, we're, everything that we can do, we're going to make sure that we move forward and cancel those meetings. Are there any large public events scheduled for the library that we need to consider canceling? I do not know that answer right now, but uh, I have been in contact with, uh, I have heard that they're considering closing the libraries because several libraries around uh, the area have closed going out west. Uh, and so that consideration is already out there, and we'll let you know as soon as possible. How about the health department meeting? Don't y'all have a meeting today? How many people that involved? Our board of health meeting, we have it today. The board of health will meet tonight. Uh, they're not scheduled again to meet till May. Uh, and we felt it important go ahead with the Board of Health meeting for the same reason that we're meeting here right now. But other than that, uh, all other meetings travel. Uh, Chrissy was supposed to be going to the Communicable Disease Conference. That's been canceled. The Health Director's meeting in Raleigh tomorrow has been canceled. Uh, relative to out-of-county travel, it's almost a moot point because everybody's shutting down. Okay. Everybody is shutting down. Yes, sir. <coughs> I know everything that I was scheduled to go to has been canceled. <coughs> okay. All right. Everything is shutting down with county government. Well, we, we, kind, we kind of have to stay here a little bit. 
but, but I, think, I think we really need to, you know, find a way with a large number of people in a, in a group that we can come up with some kind of work schedule to limit the amount of people in that building at one time. At DSS, you mean? DSS and I think the Board of Health. How many people at the Board of Health? 20. 20 FTEs. 20 FTEs. With staff and board members. What are you talking about? They have over there. They don't have nobody but patients. No, they have clients. That's what I mean. They, I mean, staff. They have staff. It's 20 something. How many? There's, there's, there's staff. Staff members. Uh huh. Is it two folks? That he needs to come Total number. 15 and 20. All staff as a whole for the health department. Uh -huh. There's 21. 21 and 51 at the social service. So, Mr. Monroe, you will work. Maybe have some kind of flex schedule or something. We can we can discuss that. Yes, with Miss Jackson and Dr. Thompson, Yvonne. Uh, discuss some flex scheduling or some ways to mitigate exposure to the, the to the virus. Yes, we can do that. We can have that discussion, and we can have some hopefully some direction with that by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody got to work. I can do it. Anything else? Mr. Chairman, I think one thing we up and, and I guess the manager and staff can be looking at this as well uh, as far as making preparations are concerned. And you all may know this, I don't. Uh, what are the steps and when will we declare a state of an emergency, state of emergency for Manson, for Manson County? You know, what conditions need to be met to do that? Uh, I think that's kind of along the lines of where you're trying to go with, with this thing. I, and like I said, there may be some guidelines for it. I just don't know what they are. Well, right, normally the state of emergency is declared during a di disaster situation, not a public health situation. But you can do it. You can do it as well, but that's what our past history has been. Don't you get special, if you declare that, don't you get special help from the state? You can help, it helps you move equipment quicker, stuff like yeah. that, uh, which the government's already done that. But there's 39 counties in North Carolina that's already declared states of emergency. Um, you can go ahead and declare it. If you want to here in the county, I've already got a draft done, um, and it goes until it's rescinded. I think that would it be also good. helps us since there's a national emergency, not a national declaration, but an emergency. Categories A and B under PA is come to the mic, Mike. I mean, come to the mic. You already have an emergency. You don't have no supply. <laughs> if you declare the emergency under uh, public assistance for category A and B, it's reimbursable, which category A is nothing but debris, so we ain't got to worry about that. But category B is emergency protective measures, so you could be reimbursed for that. Okay, now I heard on the channel nine, if I'm wrong, someone correct me, that by doing this, you get special help from the state. Mm -hmm. Faster. Is that correct? Yvonne? That ain't gonna matter for us. And for Dr. Thompson to declare a public health emergency, a local state of emergency has to be declared first. Yeah, the only reason I brought it up because I know other counties have declared a state of emergency basically because of the virus. But like I said, I don't have a clue what the guidelines are or what needs to happen before you do that and that type of thing. So well, in, in the, the the calls that I've been on and things I've listened to, what I gather from a lot of these things is that it's preparatory. It's, it's to prepare for the what will be what people are seeing to be a large infection rate coming down. Uh, and because things are still evolving at the federal level and state level, having a uh, state of emergency already declared maybe frees up some of the transition time. Uh, you can start recording time of our people working outside of certain hours so we can start maybe filling our reimbursement uh, tab so we can send it back up to the federal government if that's all possible but those those rules are still being ch challenged or developed right now so um, the president's already said at 12 o'clock don't have no more than 10 people 
he said. Up to y'all if y'all want to do the state of emergency, which the I know the president says no more than prefers no more than ten people together. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, State of emergency for the North Carolina under Executive Order 117 says no more than 100 people together. CDC's recommendation is no more than 50 together. So everybody's right. got different numbers. It's just which one you want to go with. I think CDC reduced it to 50 so far. Sir? CDC. 50, yes. Reduce it from 100 to 50. Yeah, CDC's recommendation is 50. The governor's order is 100. And then President Trump has recommended no more than 10. Which we're at like 45 cases in North Carolina now mm -hmm. with the virus. And you'll probably will see that number double very quickly. Where the county closest to us might have this disease? Mecklenburg, Cabarrus. I've heard Richmond. Y'all know if Richmond's got one? No, not yet. Uh, I know it came okay. so and it turned out to be negative. Okay. According to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, Cabarrus County, uh, Iredale County, Chatham County, Wake County, Durham County, Johnson, Harnett, Sampson, Wayne, Wilson, and then there's one way out west, Watauga. Yes. In Lincoln County, got and Foresight. In Foresight. And I picked that up from the county's website uh, on the cover page. And Lincoln County had one confirmed this morning. I talked to them before we come up here. Okay. Lincoln County had one. And also, as of 11 o'clock this morning, uh, there were no deaths in North Carolina. I don't know if that's changed since then or not. Thank you. And just a point of reference, if we are to move forward with the state of emergency, it, it does come with some pretty strong powers at that point. I mean, the game changes a little bit in regards to how we interact with the public and the public interacts with each other, potentially restricting movements, business hours closing. We're seeing some of that now, but there are a lot of rules or a lot of authority that's given to the board if we were to put in a state of emergency. It's not just for a funding mechanism mm -hmm. or if you start to restrict people's ability to live life as a normal situation. Um, so just that consideration. Yeah, when you this, read through there's that. a list of stuff in there that you can check or leave unchecked. Um, one of them is setting a curfew. I know Monroe has set a curfew for anyone under the age of 16 cannot be out between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. So and they're the ones that can't get the virus. Do what? And they're the ones not subject to get the virus. Supposedly. Yeah. Yeah. Supposedly. Okay. Control. Now, what you're saying, we can have a commission meeting as long as ain't no more 50 people here. Is that right? The CDC's recommendation is no more than 50. Governor Cooper's is 100. And the president is 10. And the president recommends 10. But the governor of North Carolina has said no more than 100, and we're in North Carolina, so we have to follow him until the president does something nationally that says 10. Says 10. But he hasn't, he hasn't done that in executive order. That's just his recommendation. If he does an executive order, then yes, 10 people national, but he's only recommended. He has not done an executive order. Those executive orders are only, they're not subject, we're not subject to an executive order. That controls his people, not us. I'm just telling you what an executive order sounds like and what it is. There's two different things. Uh, okay, I think now we've got this to, to, to look at. We can study it, and based on uh, uh, County Manager Monroe's uh, comments, you know, this is something to consider. I don't say we have to do it right now, but thank you, Rodney. But I, I think we do need to seriously consider at what point in time it may be necessary to do this. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Well, I have one other uh, comment, and it's brief. I'd like to ch thank you, Chairman Streeter, for calling this emergency meeting. Absolutely. Excellent information shared, good discussion. And I think we made two uh, uh, great decisions that will hopefully not be needed. But in the event we need uh, extra paid sick leave for certain employees, we'll have it available and ready for them. So again, thank you very much for calling this meeting. And also, 
want to reiterate, we need to act on this request of the state for emergency supplies just as quickly as we can. Thank you. Okay, now we have a scheduled meeting for Monday. We do not have to have that, that budget workshop. I, I wanted to, but understanding the situation we're in right now, uh, we can find another time to have that budget workshop. Because we got some pretty big budget items on that list, so I wanted to kind of get squared away. But understanding the situation, we can we can postpone that or cancel it. What's the right time? How you go have a curfew with everything? There ain't nothing on the grocery store shelves. <laughs> <laughs> ain't nothing to eat at, at fast food. <laughs> I had a neighbor that was looking for some chitlins this morning, couldn't find them. <laughs> had to go all the way to South Carolina, Chural, to get them. Mm -hmm. IGA in Chural. Oh, boy. Okay. Survival of the city. They got a new brain now. We're done. I make a motion. We adjourn. Second. Okay. So we won't meet. We won't meet. Then we won't meet till regular next meeting. I guess. And then what your your budget information that can wait to. I could find a way to get it to you. Uh, but I would like for a discussion with the board. But we'll we'll find a way to get you the information and we have that discussion later on. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Mr. We have a meeting to adjourn. All in favor, let it be known by. Aye. Uh, opposed. Unanimous. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Oh, I